Um, this is Shafali Sharma with the Institute yeah. for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Um, thanks, Robert. Sorry, he's calling in from Greece, and so I think the internet connection there is a little, um, it's, it's kind of faulty. So welcome you all. I don't know if you heard um, how much Robert said, but this is the, the our third uh, webinar in a series of three on TTIP. This one in particular is on antimicrobial resistance. Um, antimicrobial resistance obviously is one of the biggest public health threats of our time. It's not just a US problem or EU problem, it's actually a global problem. Um, and, it's in, and it's intrinsically linked to intensive livestock production. So today we will be talking about how TTIP affects both current and future efforts to curb antimicrobial resistance. Um, starting from where it's coming from the most in the US and the EU. So um, with that, uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. Um, if you have questions, there is a little question tab on your panel. And um, feel free to write the questions and we will field as many questions as possible um, in the 30 minutes um, that we have for question and answer after all the speakers are done. So uh, let me start with introducing our first speaker. Um, today we'll hear, um, we have three excellent speakers. Um, one is Stephen Roach from the Food Animal Concerns Trust. And uh, Stephen Roach is the Food Safety Program Director of Food Animal Concerns Trust. His current work focuses on the human health impact on animal agriculture including antimicrobial resistance. He has represented Consumers International as a delegate at various Codex Committee meetings, critical for international antibiotic standards. With that, I pass it on to Steve. Uh, thank you, Robert and Shafali, uh, for introducing me, and thanks to IATP and uh, ARC 2020 for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm mainly going to focus on uh, U.S. food uh, animal antibiotic policy um, and its relationship to the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Um, I am the Food Safety Program Dir Director of Food Animal Concerns Trust. And uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust is a Chicago-based advocacy organization that focuses on um, links between animal agriculture and health. And we're concerned about the health of the animals and the health of the people affected by animal agriculture through either um, the food they eat or through other ways that can be affected by animal agriculture. Um, we think that the overuse of antibiotics is one of the major ways that um, uh, farm animal production can impact human health. Um, and in our work with on antibiotic resistance and antibiotic overuse, we are in coalition with other groups. And uh, the um, coalition we participate in is called Keep Antibiotics Working. So the first thing, I'm using the term antibiotic resistance, but antimicrobial resistance is, uh, can also be used generally as a synonym. Antimicrobials are drugs that can um, basically uh, be used to treat any type of uh, antimicrobial infection. So that could be a viral infection, or also parasites. Antibiotics is uh, a little bit more restricted. It's a subset of that. It's uh, drugs that impact are, are able to treat um, bacterial infections. So just to quickly go over what is antibiotic resistance and why we're concerned about it. In any population of bacteria, there's some variation. And so when someone gets sick, we'll give them antibiotics and it will kill off a certain part of the, the bacteria in that population. And those would be the susceptible ones. And then usually the person's immune system can take over and address the ones that survive. But through time of using antibiotics, we increase the number, the portion of those um, bacteria that are resistant and that the drugs won't treat. Um, so, and after time, the more drugs you use, the more resistance you get. And if you use a, a large number of diverse uh, uh, antibiotics, then you basically create bacteria that are resistant to multi, many different drugs. Um, so use is really a key to um, 
the key driver for antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance. And um, in uh, 2013, last year, the United States uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, released this uh, threat report basically kind of describing how bad the problem is in the United States. Um, and what they found was that antibiotic resistant infections cause 2 million illnesses and over 23,000 deaths in the United States per year. Um, but w I would like to make clear that this is really a very conservative estimate. For example, one of the pathogens they looked at is um, E. coli uh, infections. And, but they only looked at hospital-acquired E. coli infections, and then they came up with a number that the total number of E. coli infections were 70,000. But this ignores the 7 to 8 million urinary tract infections that occur in outpatients, and so if you're, that are also mainly caused by E. coli. And there's also another large population of uh, E. coli infections in people in long-term care. So when you hear the 22 million illnesses and 20, 23,000 deaths, it's really important to recognize that this is really a, a baseline where they were, had very clear and certain numbers that they felt they could stick with. Um, 78, 6 to 8 million, that range, they were uncomfortable with using numbers like that. Um, but there are a lot more uh, resistant infections not covered by this. Um, in the bottom of this chart, it says simply using antibiotics creates resistance. These drugs should only be used to treat infections. So I think this is very important um, to remember that it's the use of drugs that drives the antibiotic resistance. So if we look at how are antibiotics used in the United States, um, on this chart you can see the, the bulk of them, 80% uh, of them, are used in um, food animals, and most of it goes into the, the feed and into the water. So the large blue, 59.2 percent, is those antibiotics that are used in feed. Most, uh, a large part of this is tetracyclines, which is a, a, a class that's been used for a long time in uh, humans, and also uh, penicillin is another one. You know, maybe in the future I'll refer to these as pen and cat, um, because these are two important ones. One thing to keep in mind is with this figure, there are some antibiotics included in these numbers that aren't used in human medicine. And their role in the, um, the impact on human health is not as clear. But even if you take out those, you get over 70% of the antibiotics used in the United States uh, going into food animals. So there, it's been the recognition between of the Im impact of animal agriculture on human health through the selection of antibiotic resistance has gone on for a long time. Back in 1968, the um, Food and Drug Administration, which is a regulatory agency in the United States that has um, uh, authority over uh, the use of animal drugs and human drugs, um, basically finalized its way of addressing, uh, saying each drug has to be approved to be shown safe and effective. Just two years after that, the agency set up a task force because they were concerned about antibiotic resistance. And in 1977, they started working to, they proposed to withdraw penicillin and tetracycline for use in food animals, some uses of them in the feed. Um, but what you'll see is, and this happened at this case, and it happens over and over, is that FDA proposes a, a plan of action because they see that there's a public health problem, that the use of these drugs in food animals is causing resistance in humans. But before they actually take an act in the U.S., they just pull back. And this is what happened here. So in 77, they proposed to withdraw some, some uses of the drugs, but then in 1980, con Congress blocked them. And there was then a long gap of inactivity on antibiotic resistance in the U.S. But in uh, the early 2000s, the Food and Drug Administration again said, we're going to do something about this. So what they did is they created a new way to evaluate the resistance. So if you use a drug this way, how much resistance? Is it going to be a high risk, risk, a low risk, or a medium risk? And they, applied, they said they were going to apply this to old drugs. They went and applied it to old drugs and found many of the, of the older drugs that they were using, again, penicillin and tetracycline, um, were a high risk and they shouldn't be used uh, in food animals in the way they were doing. But then they never took an action. And then in 2009, when the Obama administration came in, then they uh, developed uh, something they called as a voluntary plan uh, to address the problem. 
So in the FDA's current plan is for a voluntary phase out of growth, the drugs of use for growth promotion. Um, they also will move all feed and water drugs to um, you require a veterinary's order. And they'll also, um, but one thing they aren't ad addressing is the use of antibiotics for prevention and control of disease. And these are antibiotic uses that are very similar to those um, that are as for growth promotion. They're at low uh, levels, lower than what you would need to um, treat a disease. Um, and they can be used for long periods of time in unhealthy animals. Uh, the other problem we have in the U.S. is we only have national sales data. We don't actually know how antibiotics are used in specific animals. So we know how much penicillin is used in the United States or sold for use in, in the United States in food animals. But we don't know where it goes. Does it go to pigs? Does it go to chickens? Or does it go to um, a cattle or turkeys? So our biggest problem with uh, FDA's approach is this uh, lack of addressing the, uh, the use of antibiotics for disease prevention. And part of the problem is there's a no clear distinction between growth and prevention. So these are used in, uh, in healthy animals. And the other problem with the approach is it does not address farm practices that create the need for antibiotics. In a, so. So there's a lot of organizations in the United States pushing for change. Um, my organization, FACT, a lot of the mainstream uh, environmental organizations, um, and then also some of the, uh, the uh, health organizations are also working on that, um, like the Infectious Disease Society and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, we have several things we're trying to do, strengthen the federal response. We're trying to get FDA to do more and close this prevention loophole, loophole where it's also federal and state legislation. And on, on to the right of this slide, you can see the California bill um, is probably going to get passed, but all it's really doing is making the FDA's growth promoter van um, basically restating it for the state of California. The final thing is purchasing policy. But we're getting a lot of resistance to this change from the animal agriculture industry and also from the pharmaceutical industry. And interesting things have happened is there's been these big alliances of uh, uh, farm interests that are kind of pushing back on us. And if you look at this slide, it says why animal, antibiotic use in animals is safe for everyone. So it's basically saying you don't need to change anything. Steve, you have about um, a minute. OK. Hmm. And um, so now. So how is this, uh, what does uh, transatlantic trade and investment partnership? Well, one concern we have is that it's designed to be the least trade restrictive. In the U.S., by not having addressed the growth promoters even, is about uh, over a decade behind EU on uh, non-therapeutic uses. Um, and one example of that is 70% uh, of feedlot cattle are getting tylosin. We really, the, one of the big interests in the U.S. is getting our cattle to be sold in Europe. But also 20% of them are getting injectable antibiotics uh, uh, to uh, basically get, uh, keep them from getting sick from uh, respiratory disease. And there is uh, one, one antibiotic we may be a little bit better on that's fluoroquinolones, which is a very important antibiotic for treating the diseases in humans, where the U.S. has put more restrictions on in Europe. But if we go to the lowest common den dominate, denominator, everybody loses. And so there is room for change. This slide just says that there are some studies that show that we can do other things besides giving antibiotics. And we still can maintain our productivity. And finally, why would we want to change? Is because we really don't want people like this. This is my daughter, Eloisa, to get sick and not be able to be treated. And that's what I'm afraid about for the future. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, so that was from the U.S. side. Now I hand over to Richard Young, who's the policy director of the Sustainable Food Trust based in the U.K. Much of his work focuses on various aspects of true cost accounting for agriculture externalities, including cost of antibiotics overuse on farms. Uh, Richard is quite an expert on antibiotics and, and the state of regulations in the EU. So I hand it over to you, Richard. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shafali. Um, I'm going to um, talk, if I can, about the issues that relate to uh, the 
transatlantic trade and investment partnership in relation to antibiotics uh, because many of the um, microbiological issues are the same in the US and in the European Union. Um, so that the points that Steve has just made really apply over here as well. And now, what some of you may know is that in the US, the, has been a, there's been a voluntary ban on the use of antibiotics for growth promotion recently. Uh, but the concern is that um, there will still be really the same continuing level of use under other names. Now, what's happened in Europe over the last 20 years is, is, um, is quite educational in this respect. I've been uh, campaigning on antibiotic issues now for about 20 years for the Soil Association, but I recently took up a new post with the Sustainable Food Trust. Our principal area of interest in this is actually what we call true cost accounting and looking at the true cost to society of many of the things that are happening in agriculture, including the overuse of antibiotics. But I'm also involved with um, an alliance in the UK called the Alliance for to save our antibiotics and with a global alliance, the antimicrobial, the antibiotic resistance coalition. Uh, now this advertisement on the left shows how adv antibiotics were advertised to the farming industry as making their animals get off to a flying start. And antibiotics were put into pig and poultry feed from the day that a chicken and a pig was born until the day it was slaughtered without any withdrawal period. But even after antibiotic growth promoters were banned throughout the European Union between 1997 and 2007. The industry was still advertising them to farmers, uh, other antibiotics, therapeutic antibiotics that could be used in similar, though not quite the same ways, uh, as, as you see on this image on the right hand side, with the same flying start um, uh, concept, so that farmers knew what was being talked about. And even really very blatantly, they were saying goodbye to the growth promoters here with this rainbow uh, symbolism which farmers understood to be the growth promoters and introducing new antibiotics in their place. The big thing that caused us to uh, get rid of the antibiotic growth promoters in Europe though was the uh, fact that um, after the hormone ban in Europe in, in beef cattle which Britain didn't actually support but was forced to go along with, with it because of the rest of the European Union, um, an antibiotic growth motor was widely promoted to cattle farmers. And by the mid 1990s, 30% uh, of all British cattle, 80% uh, of all British pigs and 98% of all British chickens were routinely having one antibiotic growth motor put in their feed called Avatan or the antibiotic was Avoparsin, which was in fact vancomycin, the drug of last resort in human medicine under another name. And once this became common knowledge, it did lead to changes. And it's interesting, this graph was prepared by a colleague of mine, Colin Noonan, who's still working very much in this area. And this shows what happened after the um, bans on uh, antibiotic growth motors in European Union. The first two columns here, you'll see for the antibiotic uh, avilomycin in Danish broilers before the ban, after the ban, a dramatic fall in resistance levels in um, VRE, in, 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 sorry, in enterococci in uh, Danish broilers, and a similar thing in uh, um, Danish broilers with, with avoparsin, which is effectively vancomycin, and then reflected, um, this is from Germany, the figures here showing similar falls in the human population to these same antibiotics, um, and in the Netherlands uh, to a different antibiotic growth mode. So the important thing about this is it does show that if you ban or restrict use of antibiotics, they will over time lead to, that will over time will lead to big falls in resistance. Here, very quickly, just some of the, um, and the bacteria that we know are a particular issue with farming. And I should just say for anyone who's listening, that farming is not the only cause of antibiotic resistance. Overuse in humans for many conditions is the primary cause of resistance, and we need to use antibiotics more sparingly in all fields, not just in farming. Um, this slide very quickly illustrates uh, the way in which E. coli blood poisoning has increased fourfold in, the Europe, in the UK over the last 20 years, and we showed that that's a direct result of the um, increase in the use of antibiotics and the rising levels of resistance as reflected by these uh, uh, other lines here. 
Uh, but nothing much really started to happen in Europe until um, these two issues came to the forefront. Uh, the new type of MRSA became a major problem in mainland Europe and it's still um, a significant problem with about 50% of pigs contaminated in some countries and a significant number of fatalities now in the human population. It's a strain of MRSA which is spread globally um, and it's, it spreads from, it lives happily on both farm animals and humans. And the other issue is E. coli, um, a gut bacteria which cause urinary tract infections, as Steve mentioned, which when they're not uh, effectively treated because of resistance, go on to produce, uh, cause blood poisoning. And the important thing about this is that we are really running out of antibiotics to treat these type of infections, the E. coli ones, salmonella, um, and a range of related bacteria, including gonorrhea, which all require what are called gram-negative antibiotics. Now, they're particularly hard to develop. We do still have some antibiotics to treat MRSA, but we really have nothing in the pipeline to treat the E. coli type of um, resistance, and that's where the biggest concern lies. This just briefly shows how a particular worrying type of resistance in um, chickens in the Netherlands was increasing during the 2000s. And here um, I wanted to explain to you, um, beginning now to see what was, well, we start looking at data, what the, the problems are going to find in, in, in the US. Um, if you look at the figures here, this is actually from 2010, there are some slightly more recent figures but I haven't had time to put them in. The Netherlands here you'll see this is the total uh, antibiotic usage per weight of animals, in the, it, it's, it's a particular weight of animals they use for a population correction unit. And if you look at the United Kingdom, you'll see we appear to be better off than the Netherlands. And if you look at Denmark, they appear to be better off still. However, it, this is highly misleading because um, in the UK and in most countries, pigs account for a much higher proportion of antibiotic use than other animals. Poultry next. These are the figures for the UK. 60% for pigs, 34.5% for poultry roughly, 4% for cattle, half a percent for sheep and maybe 1% for other species. Now the implications of that, um, if we look at the first of all the five Nordic countries, you'll see if we actually put in correct these for the different numbers of animals here. You'll see um, here that in the UK only 10.7% of UK animals are pigs, but nearly 40% are sheep. And because sheep have very small amounts, you'd expect that mean, would mean our, our antibody usage would be lower. But in fact, when corrected properly for the pigs and poultry, we're using 179 kilograms per uh, population correction unit. Whereas Richard, Denmark, you, you have two minutes. Four, Two minutes. Thank you. Um, the Netherlands, if we add the Netherlands in, it's 110. So this shows that in order to make comparisons between countries, we do have to look at the type of animals that are being produced, and that's very important. Um, not that we shouldn't be trying to reduce them. If you take organic pigs and poultry, the use is something like 300 times less than even Denmark. But nevertheless, if we're comparing intensive farming and seeing how that's doing, we do need to make these, these adjustments. Um, now, the Netherlands has done particularly well, and they've made a real effort in recent, since 2007 because they, they've had this major problem with MRSA and with um, ESBL E. coli. If you look here in 1999, the therapeutic use of antibiotics in the Netherlands was just over 300 tonnes. In addition to that, they used 250 tonnes of antibiotic growth motors. Um, after the growth motors were banned, if we look here, roughly most of them being banned by 2003, there was this increase in the use of therapeutic antibiotics, and that is what I fear you will start to see in the US over the coming years, and it really needs to be avoided if possible. Fortunately, though, since they've had this big problem with MRSA, they've made a really big effort, and they've brought their total antibiotic use down because they've now taken out the antibiotic growth modes completely, and they brought their therapeutics down to here 249 tons, but in fact the latest figures show just 209 tons. So there's been a dramatic reduction from 550 to 209 tons of antibiotics in the Netherlands. Now, the legislation situation in the European Union, we've been expecting 
a new veterinary medicines directive, a new medicated feeding stuffs directive, EUI surveillance for antimicrobial resistance in live animals and meat and guidelines for responsible use. Now, none of those things have actually materialized after two years, and we have to ask the question why. Now, I believe I mean, part of the reason is that it, we don't have full agreement between the European Union uh, member states, and I think Britain is one of the countries which is dragging its feet on this. Uh, another reason is that um, I suspect there's, there's a reluctance to take the step which we'd like to see, which is, and many people within European countries want to see, and in many of the countries, even Denmark and, and, and is, is supporting this, which is to actually outlaw the routine prophylactic use of antibiotics in healthy animals, which is how a large proportion of antibiotics are still used. And this is one of the prime cause for the campaign groups that I'm involved with, in addition to getting rid of the use of the most critically important antibiotics. So what I think we have to really guard against with the transatlantic trade and investment policy is that we have a situation where they'll be able to say they ban the growth motors, and unless we keep a close eye on this, we'll end up in a situation where, in fact, antibiotics are still being used in the same way, and this will very much dilute the whole uh, concept of controlling antibiotics across the European Union as well. And finally, I'll just uh, mention the two campaign groups, the Alliance to Save Our Antibiotics, the coordinators, Alison Craig, and she can be contacted here, and they've just recently produced a report, and they've got a petition running, and the Antibiotic Resistance Coalition, which is a global alliance, um, there's a press very recently launched, a press release here, and the declaration setting out our uh, demands, which are for much more radical understanding of the fact that we have to live, learn to live with bacteria and not constantly be throwing um, toxic chemicals at them, because they're going to have the last laugh if we do. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, so the third speaker, I will be the third speaker. Um, I'm the director of the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policies, Agricultural Commodities and Globalization Initiative. Over the last decades, my work has focused on international trade and its implications for food and agricultural policies. So, so what, what does the, this issue on antibiotics resistance, what does this have to do with um, TTIP? TTIP or TAFTA is the, hang on, just trying to get full screen here. Um, Uh, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TAFTA as we call it in the U.S. because it's reminiscent of, of NAFTA on steroids, is uh, potentially one of the largest trade agreements in history given the EU and the U.S. make up about 50% of the world's GDP and 30% of the world's trade. Moreover, since this agreement is not about tariffs so much because average duty between the U.S. and the EU is 3 to 4%, this is potentially a global standard setting agreement as the U.S. and the EU seek to remove regulatory and other non-tariff barriers to trade. Hence my title, Antibiotics and Regulatory Resistance in TTIP. Um, from our previous speakers, it's obvious um, that you know, the U.S. is about 10 years behind the EU on actually creating mandatory bans on using antibiotics as growth promoters and that the EU has a ways to go in, in clearing out loopholes on antibiotic um, regulation when it comes to subtherapeutic uh, applications of antibiotics, particularly in the animal agriculture industry. So future regulations are essential, and, and as both speakers have pointed out, uh, there are campaigns underway both at the federal and the state level and the member state level to strengthen these regulations. So what does TTIP have to do with this? Um, the, the critical issues at stake with TTIP are transparency, um, regulatory coherence, and investment. Uh, this is a completely opaque agreement. Uh, we do not, as civil society, have access to the negotiating texts. Um, it sets new international norms on how regulations should be set in the two regions with implications for other trade agreements. And both sides favor a highly problematic investor-to-state clause, which would allow foreign investors to sue governments over rules or laws that undermine their expected profits. So when it comes to transparency, 
as I said, information that we are able to get um, is only through leaked text, mainly from the EU and what we know from industry proposals. And just today, IATP, in fact, has leaked a document uh, revealing the EU's draft proposal on food safety, its food safety chapter, the sanitary and phytosanitary chapter of TTIP. And it's thanks to leaks like this that we're able to, you know, give you an analysis. But even the leak that we got um, has mentioned several annexes, uh, which are not there yet, and nor do we have a chance to see them unless we get a leaked document. And this is completely the wrong way to deal with trade policy that will have significant impacts on, on regulations that are important for public health or the environment. So this is one major critique. And I should just say that there's no reason for this kind of opaqueness because um, after, you know, prodding the WTO for many years, the WTO now puts a negotiating text online and, and country proposals online um, for everyone to see. And if an institution like the WTO can do it, certainly the European Union and the United States who pride themselves for democratic rule making uh, can do this. The other key issue here, and particularly for antibiotics regulation, is regulatory coherence. And where it comes up in TTIP is through the, as I said, the SPS and the TBT chapters of the agreement that are WTO plus. So TBT stands for Technical Barriers to Trade, and it usually has to do with packaging and labeling issues, um, which are also essential when we talk about um, regulation of certain types of antibiotics and the types of labeling. Um, that uh, pharmaceutical oil industry is required to put on this. Um, so what will the uh, regulatory cooperation chapter, and, and in addition, the third uh, element is the regulatory cooperation chapter. And the regulatory cooperation chapter is a, is a horizontal chapter uh, with sweeping ramifications for regulations, whether they are food safety regulations or environmental regulations. Um, again, this comes from a leaked EU proposal on what a regulatory cooperation chapter would look like. And what it proposes is a regulatory cooperation council composed of trade and regu uh, regulatory officials. Um, its aim would be to minimize differences in regulations uh, with the goal to make them least trade restrictive, as Steve pointed out. Now, how do you minimize differences in regulations when they are so wide apart as in the US and the EU? It's antibiotics regulation. That's a big question. Um, and particularly if the lens is least trade restrictive. Um, we see that that means that there is more likely to be a weakening of standards than strengthening of standards. How they will do this, they will uh, do this through a process of notification of any proposed regulations, legislations, or executive orders, and through notice and comment period uh, throughout the process. And there's proposals of doing a cost-benefit analysis and trade impact assessments. So what this means in concrete terms, um, for the EU side, this would include primary legislation and some of the directives and regulations that um, Richard pointed out uh, could be at stake. What you would have is that the EU would have to notify the US that these directives and regulations are being proposed and whether um, the U.S. side has anything to say about it. Um, you have implementing measures that can also be, uh, that would have to be notified, and even non-legislative acts. For the U.S. side, we're talking about congressional bills, U.S. federal exec um, and rules made by U.S. federal executive and its independent agencies, including U.S. states and EU member states. So it's a pretty wide scope, what we're talking about here. Um, which could affect future regulations, campaigns, um, and, and directives on restricting subtherapeutic use of antibiotics for animal use. And another reason this is of concern is that uh, these kinds of mechanisms open up new avenues for foreign governments and corporations to influence lawmaking, even beyond what we have today. For instance, today in the USTR and the United States Trade Representative's Office, there's already significant corporate privilege. 85% of our 566 advisors from the uh, uh, trade advisors are from the industry. And with the EU, uh, we know that there are mostly closed door meetings with industry, and the industry is the primary stakeholder there, particularly for DG trade. So this kind of puts civil society outside of this process and uh, marginalizes public health concerns. And if you add investor state dispute settlement, which I talked about, 
earlier, allowing foreign investors to sue um, governments for um, expected profits under the agreement, then we really are talking about uh, a massive chilling effect on future regulations. And this is the biggest concern when it comes to what is really needed to tackle antibiotic resistance in the next decade. Uh, what it would do in effect is prevent um, uh, stronger laws and legislations um, and, and perhaps use the scientific uncertainty related to data around how much is animal industry, how much is human um, you know, overuse uh, to delay rulemaking. So I just want to quickly talk about the industry interests in TTIP, the meat industry in particular. There's a publication that we've done, it's called 10 Reasons TTIP is Bad for Good Food and Farming, that really outlines the public submissions that the U.S. side, uh, the U.S. Meat and, meat and feed industry have given to the United States Trade Representative. Um, we have every reason to believe that the, the industrial meat industry in the EU doesn't have very divergent views on this. It's just that their views are not really made public. Um, in this case, we were lucky enough to have these public comments. And the American Meat Institute, which represents about 90% of the meat industry, basically said, indeed, the TTIP for them is an opportunity to remove numerous non-scientific regulatory barriers that exist between the two to have mar greater market access. And I just want to point out that the EU-US meat trade, I mean, the, both sides are top global competitors in exports of pork and poultry. So the US is the number one pork exporter, the EU is number two. The, uh, the US is number two uh, poultry exporter in the world, and the EU is number three. Um, the US is seeking the EU beef market and expanding its poultry market. Uh, the EU wants access to US dairy and beef market. And these food safety measures are the ones that restrict mass growth and processing, uh, you know, the restrict mass growth and processing techniques seen as barriers to trade. So um, what we as civil society are trying to tackle are basically, uh, in, in terms of strengthening standards, are what are seen as barriers. So this we need to keep in mind. Um, so what are some of the key asks from this industry? Well, one is to do away with the EU's precautionary principle. The second is the EU's acceptance of cultural preferences or other legitimate factors in the context of international standard setting bodies like Codex, but also, also obviously in TTIP as a basis for human health and food safety standards. Um, the precautionary principle, uh, for those of you who don't uh, are not familiar with this is, is the principle that the EU uses uh, to justify actions that should be taken to avoid or diminish any harm to humans and the environment. And it is grounded in science, unlike what the US says, but it does not need 100% certainty to be acted upon. It's good enough that there seems to be a risk of a certain product that goes on market um, to, be, to be able to regulate it. Um, so this is also a principle that uh, environmental and food safety advocates and food advocates in the U.S. also support, um, but this has been opposed by U.S. Trade Administration and it is seen as being compromised by DG Trade in the European Union as well. Another few of the key asks, for, for instance, like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association says, we strongly discourage the continued use of any negative list of substances approved for animal agriculture. Now the negative list is a technical term used to basically say that you should not limit um, our access to trade uh, certain substances by listing only the ones that can be traded. So we should assume that all substances are free for trade unless otherwise explicitly stated. It basically turns this upside down. Um, uh, the North American Meat Institute again talks about uh, you know conducting a sound cost-benefit analysis, which is also what the EU proposes in this regulatory cooperation chapter. So you can see um, how similar the interests are between what is being proposed uh, by the meat industry and what is being proposed in TTIP. So the trade timeline for now in the U.S., uh, what we need is to really put our energies behind and uh, for food and health activists to really help stop fast track. Fast track is basically is what Obama administration is looking for. 
to restrict Congress to just a yes or no vote at the end when everything has been finalized uh, without being able to create any amendments or even um, have a thorough public debate uh, or a floor debate in Congress. So I think there is significant momentum for that in the U.S. and there's an opportunity to join that. The next round, uh, TTIP round, is scheduled in September in Washington, um, but the, the rounds will keep going, moving between Brussels and Washington. So there's plenty of time to engage. And of course, they keep talking about you know it, the negotiations being completed at the end of this year. Now there's talk about possibly end of next year, but there's also a significant um, pressure building up, uh, especially in the European Union amongst member states. Uh, a lot of people are waking up to this and getting quite concerned because this also affects environmental policy, chemicals, fracking, all kinds of issues. And there are campaigns, active campaigns. So what you can do is stay informed and get involved. Uh, there's some contacts here for IITP. There's a Citizens Trade Campaign in the U.S., which is an umbrella organization uh, platform for a lot of different organizations with issues. Um, ARC 2020, and I don't know if you could hear Robert, but ARC 2020 is a broad coalition of food and farming organizations working towards a just and sustainable agriculture policy in the EU and engaging on TTIP's impacts on food and farming. There's also the Seattle to Brussels network in, the, in, in Europe, which is also a platform that's bringing together a lot of different groups. So lots of opportunity to engage, and as Richard has talked about, there's also, and Steve, there's also coalitions in the US and the EU uh, working specifically on antibiotic resistance, and I think TTIP should be a key issue on your agenda. Thank you very much. So now um, I, sh I should move into questions. Um, hold on one second. So lots of questions. Um, the first question is, what share of these incidents did the CDC report were resistant to antimicrobials largely used in animal agriculture? Um, so Steve, I don't know if you can answer that question. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have the report exactly. In terms of the, the 23,000 or the 2 million illnesses, um, uh, there, uh, one of the big concerns within the, um, the CDC report is for cephalosporin resistance, which is not one that's used um, non-therapeutically, non um, or generally not. <laughs> it, it does have some control uses. But if you think about it, for, the, for those gram-negatives like E. coli, cephalosporins is one of the most important ones. It is used a little bit in food animals. But another thing you need to be aware of is because of co-resistance, which is where you have these very large uh, genetic elements that will contain resistance to multiple drugs. So if you use one of them, you can select for them. So we use an awful lot of tetracycline in, in food animals. and. Um, what you can show is that in food animals, if you treat first with the cephalosporin and then use the tetracycline, it basically maintains the resistance over time. So I, I think that the question is it, is, it is important to be aware that there are some differences and there's some of the same. But if you continue to use even ones that we don't use that very much in human medicine, like tetracycline, it can also be, help spread around resistance to other drugs that are more important, um, particularly something like cephalosporin. I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, another way to think about it is some of the older drugs like ampicillin are alternatives to the most uh, new drugs that we're more concerned about. So if you can use an ampicillin, then you don't need to use a cephalosporin or a fluoroquinolone, um, which is a more uh, newer drug than that you would use for resistant infections. If we can keep using those older drugs that are the ones that are used more commonly in food animals, then we, um, we're actually moving the, the ball, you know, we're protecting the newer drugs as well, even if they aren't using a food animal. Some of the newer drugs like linezolid and, um, and vanc well, vancomycin aren't using food animals, but there is, the resistance to them is impacted by the food animal use, um, either through uh, cross-resistant, co-resistance, or this uh, effect where if you create resistance to an older drug, then you have to use a new one. Uh, thank you for that. 
Um, the next question is, are there any major food processing, food retail, or restaurant chains that reject meats or poultry from animals raised with non-therapeutic use of antibiotics? And how do such companies respond to an AMR lobbying campaign? And Richard, maybe you can start, and then Steve, you could follow. I'm not aware of any in the European Union, apart from within the, um, you know, the, the very small organic sector where um, such things are obviously outlawed. Um, there have been um, calls on some supermarkets to um, reduce their use of antimicrobials, but unfortunately, it's it's it's, it's uh, the use of what a civil servant phrase in the UK. It's a bit like trying to nail jelly to a wall because they are slippery customers, and you, it's very difficult to get straightforward answers out of them. Um, I, this is an area that needs a great deal of attention. Um, but can, if I could just take a brief moment to add something to what Steve was saying about the the actual um, incident to answer his question about the incidence of, 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 of antibiotic resistance infections that are due to farming. This is the one big area which isn't known. And one, it probably never will be known. And the reason for that is it's just too complicated. The, the problem is that you not only have bacteria passing from animals to humans, but the resistance genes can pass separately on different bacteria through the environment, and then they can come back and mix up again because they're highly transferable. And not only that, they can mutate and change on, on the way. There's only been one study which actually really looked at how big a role food is playing in antibiotic resistance. And this was conducted in France. They, they tested the number of resistant bacteria in the stomachs of volunteers. They fed them a sterile diet for three weeks, three days, and they found there was a 99.5% reduction in resistant bacteria. Now that shows that actually food is playing a really big part in uh, the resistant bacteria in our gut. And the resistant bacteria in our gut have a whole range of impacts on on our resistant infections. So I'd say it's, it's, it's very significant for a number of infections like E. coli um, and Salmonella. It's, prob it's, 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 it's non-existent for things like tuberculosis uh, and some respiratory infection. Very big split like that. Uh, th thank you both for that. Um, are there other questions that the audience wants to, uh, to type in? You should see a little question tab um, there and feel free to type in questions. Uh, while we wait for any further questions, um, maybe I could ask you both, um, but given the fact that you are in different antibiotics uh, resistance uh, civil society led initiatives, how much of an awareness is there about uh, trade agreements and to the extent that they could actually have a chilling effect on future regulation and is this something that's being discussed or has been discussed or our groups beginning to engage on these issues. Um, Steve, maybe you want to start? I would say generally the civil society organizations in the U.S. are not aware of um, the trade impacts. We're, you know, we're almost um, kind of focusing on the federal regulatory agencies and the um, state and um, federal legislation. So I, I think we aren't terribly a, a aware of it. I work you know, some with the Codex Alimentarius, so I have, you know, a little bit of awareness of, of, of potential trade impacts. So, but in general, I, I don't think people are paying much attention to the trade, particularly in, in this area. But on, on the other hand, you know, the, the number of groups that are working on antibiotic resistance is quite broad, and so I'm not always aware of everything that everyone's doing, because there's a lot of different um, uh, civil society organizations in the U.S. working on it. Mm -hmm. um, and also, since you just spoke, did you want to say anything about uh, any major food processing or food retailer restaurant chains um, in the U.S. who have made some announcements about antibiotic use? Well, in, in the U.S. we do have some fairly large ones, and what we they tend to do is go for what they would use antibiotic-free labels. Um, so Chipotle is a uh, burrito chain. Um, another one is Panera, which they are basically a bread and a sandwich shop. Um, a major kind of fast food place, Chick Fil A, um, just announced that they were going to go antibiotic free, and, and they're, uh, I think it's in the poultry. Most of this is in, in, in poultry, though. Um, uh, you know, Chipotle actually has all of those in there. 
And the other thing I would say in the U.S. is even in, uh, you know, in most grocery stores, you can find products labeled for antibiotic free. Um, and how, how it works in most cases is that um, they aren't allowed to use antibiotics for any of these products. So if they have to treat them, the animals get out, you know, have to go into another marketing chain. Um, and, you know, to some extent that's uh, problematic because it may create incentives not to treat. And, but as Richard said, it, the problem is if you let them go to some other level of uh, control, then it's like jelly and it's very hard to create something that you can trust that is, okay, we'll only use antibiotics appropriately. And I, I think that's a bigger challenge and, and there's not a lot of trust and there's not a lot of transparency that would allow um, uh, something like that to actually work there. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. Um, okay, we see more questions coming in. Um, somebody asked, can we say a little more about the mechanism um, on how it would restrict future legislation, which seems to be the biggest threat in antibiotics and TTIP? I'm assuming with mechanism you mean probably the Regulatory Cooperation Council, uh, which is being proposed as part of the the regulatory cooperation chapter. Um, my understanding is that uh, basically you would have trade diplomats and, and regulatory officials on a, on a council that would vet any kind of proposed bills or legislation that's coming up either in the US or in the EU. And what, depending on how the outcome of the negotiations goes, if there's a cost benefit analysis required or a trade impact assessment required, you basically have a body within a trade agreement that is looking at the goal of being least trade restrictive vetting these kinds of rules. And so, like I said, there would be kind of a notice period and there would be a comment period. And so during that comment period, um, people would be allowed to comment into that council. And what people and who would be allowed that access is a big question for us. And we suspect that it will be, you know, experts and trade advisors. And trade advisors are heavily biased towards industry. And the issues are then around cost-benefit analysis is very key because who's going to be conducting that cost-benefit analysis and cost-benefit analysis of what? I mean, so are we going to be looking at public health? Um, are we going to be looking at environmental issues there? So that's kind of how it will work that we, that for, based on the EU leaked, um, uh, proposal on this on this chapter and uh, you know right now the the leak that we just came out with today for instance there's references to annexes uh, there isn't any reference to antibiotics or GMOs or anything like this but there could be potential annexes that talk about some of these issues but we don't have access to those they haven't even been negotiated yet as far as we know um, you know, somebody is asking, because of the lack of transparency in TTIP, does this mean that there are a few publications available on the EU's position on AMR? Um, uh, maybe, Richard, can you talk about what is publicly available on the EU's position on antibiotics resistance so far? Uh, there's, there's actually nothing uh, available publicly. Uh, we, we, we did have a meeting with um, some of the civil servants about a year ago and they told us that the legislation would definitely be published by Christmas. That didn't happen. That was uh, we'd be, it had been published a year published a year before, which is what makes us concerned that um, the, this issue has been constantly deferred to the future. The latest suggestion is that we might see something in October. The the good news is that the European Union has already imposed restrictions on the use of modern cephalosporins, um, so that they they can no longer be used. Um, off-label, and they, which means uh, for its species, which they're not licensed. Uh, the UK poultry industry has agreed to stop using them completely. They were never licensed for poultry, but because of the loopholes in the legislation, it was still possible to use them in poultry before that. Um, there, there, there is progress, and I, th I think that uh, while I'm always, I normally tend to look at what still needs to be done, and I'm usually very critical of the intensive livestock industry. I think we should recognise actually that the uh, TTIP actually um, pr creates problems for progressive farmers who have made efforts to reduce their use of antibiotics and we can see what's happened in the Netherlands 
they've made very big strides there to reuse antibiotics. Same thing has happened in Denmark, in most of the uh, of the Scandinavian countries, if probably all of them, and even in the UK, there are a significant number of progressive vets and farmers who are starting now to use antibiotics more sparingly and and more carefully. We've got a long way to go yet, but if we see the sort of slippage that could occur. If we, um, if we, if this trade agreement goes through in in the way we fear it will do, then that's going to be bad for all farmers who are making an effort because, in fact, they'll be in competition with producers who are still uh, using antibiotics in the same routine way, even if they're giving out the signals that they're not. Thank, you. thank you. Um, okay, we have lots of comments and questions, and we have. Um, well, officially we are over, I mean, almost to the time's up, but I think let's take a few more minutes since we had some technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, I see somebody says, I heard about recent changes in the U.S. on vet rights to prescribe. Apparently they would not be required to see and examine the animal. In the EU, we're fighting to get vets to only be able to prescribe, not sell antibiotics. What about the U.S.? Stephen, can you answer that? Yeah, we... Essentially, there's a FDA is doing rulemaking on um, on how what type of veterinary oversight is required for antibiotics used in feed. Most of them right now are over the counter, but they want to uh, move them over to where they require veterinary oversight. Um, and there's an existing rule that basically says a vet has to have a proper relationship with the farm, which means it understands the farm that it's seen the vet seen the animals, and that would be a requirement before the vet could order antibiotics for those animals. Yeah, but the FDA has proposed to actually remove that requirement and just leave it up to individual state requirements. Um, so whatever the states decide. The problem is, is uh, the rule on uh, veterinary oversight and livestock feed in the U.S. has been separated from antibiotic prescribing. Most states actually don't have rules covering the, the use of what vets can, how vets can um, actually use and, or order antibiotics for use in, in feed. So I think there's, there is a concern about the, the veterinary oversight. I think more veterinary oversight is uh, appropriate, um, but uh, we're actually weakening the rules on what that would mean. And also there's not a whole lot of um, evidence that I have that the vets are interested in trying to reduce antibiotic use. And in the U.S. we, we would still also have vets there's no movement to um, restrict their ability to make profits off of selling antibiotics. Okay, um, and then I'll, I'll just take this one last question and a quick comment. Um, Stephen seems to be saying that programs that allow appropriate use of antibiotics are not as transparent as programs that go for totally antibiotic free. However, the entire EU organic regulation is pre predicated on appropriate use of antibiotics. And as Richard has said, this works well and reduces antibiotic use massively. What, why does Stephen think this can't work in the U.S.? Both certified humane and animal welfare approved in the U.S. already work on this basis on appropriate use of antibiotics only and no subtherapeutic antibiotics. So maybe, um, Stephen, you want to comment on that? And I don't know, Richard, if you have additional comments after Stephen. Yeah, we again we we do support the use of the um, the, the organic, and I, I think that does work. I, I think the the challenges in the U.S. Um, there there are some concerns about organic, uh, basically um, people not using antibiotics when they should to maintain the organic. I at least as far as I have seen is it is much more difficult to find something that's in between and it's much more difficult to um, uh, get consumers to actually recognize the, the other types of marketing. Though, though I, I do agree there are some, some good programs out there that um, try to do a better job on that, but I, I, I still think we have had, um, unless you have uh, a lot of transparency, um, and this is where I, I am concerned about a lot of the kind of some of the other la labels. Um, unless you have transparency, um, it's very difficult to do this. So I think if in these cases where we have transparency, the certified organic has some mechanisms for creating transparency 
and so do some of the humane farming labels. But in general, we, we don't have that level of transparency. So unless you have um, that, that mechanism in place, and in general, it's not there for a lot of the animal production. So. Richard, a minute to comment on yeah, anything, so actually, either this and also on TTIP. <laughs> On the organic side, it's, it's quite an interesting point there, really, which is that, in a sense, the boot's almost on the other foot um, here, because um, in the US, um, antibiotics are not allowed in organic farming at all, whereas they are in the EU. And I personally think that the US position is misguided and just based on a marketing approach, because um, as a farmer myself, I know that there are occasions when anti animals need antibiotics, and I personally don't see that it being, it's wrong to use appropriate antibiotics appropriately with an extended withdrawal period for individual animals that are actually sick. What I think is wrong to use is in what section, and I don't think that actually endangers human health really to any significant extent. What does endanger human health is using antibiotics routinely over long periods of time at low levels in large numbers of animals. So uh, we, you could see actually um, the organic produce in the, from the EU not being able to get into uh, the US unless there's some relaxation of trade rules there. Well, I'll leave you to ponder that. The other key thing, of course, about organic systems is the reason they don't need so much is because the, the whole systems are designed to keep animals healthy as naturally as possible. And whereas pigs are the animals that use the most antibiotics in intensive farming, they're the actually animals that use the least antibiotics in organic farming. Uh, large, fairly large-scale organic pig enterprises need no antibiotics at all in their young pigs. Uh, they do it just occasionally need to treat a, an older pig if they if they have an accident or if they have a problem after a, a farrowing or something of that sort. Um, the um, on the trade uh, the TTIP issue, I can only really just reinforce what I've said. It's taken me a long time to get my head around this, and it is a question of trying to sort of with the fear of the unknown, working out what might be going to happen, but. Uh, I had thought for a while that because we have got a fairly robust approach to food safety within the European Union compared with the US, that we'd stand our ground and, 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 and everybody claims that we will do. But it's not as straightforward as that. If you fact that we've got 28 member states and they're not all thinking alike on this, and there's clearly we're already having difficulty getting agreement on improving antibiotic use between those 28 member states. And we've got to remember that countries like Britain are very much taking, very much take the U.S. line over some of these issues on hormones in beef. Britain tried hard to allow hormones in beef to be continue being used, and we, those of us in the U.K., are very grateful that the rest of the European Union wouldn't allow that to happen. So they could divide and rule here, and I think we do need to watch this very, very carefully to see what's going to happen. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, we are nearly six minutes over, and I and I want to conclude with um, just what Richard is saying. I think what's important here um, is that the you know De Gucht, the the trade commissioner in the EU, is making a lot of noise about saying, "Well, oh, we're not going to weaken our regulatory standards. Uh, we're not going to do anything on GMOs. We're not going to do anything on antibiotics." in specific. And I think what's important to understand about TTIP is that it's the rules that are being set in place by trade policy experts and trade diplomats that are going to be intervening on public health regulation, on food safety regulation. And it's very, and the fact that it's happening behind closed doors without any uh, public debate about these issues, about without the text being shared, really puts those of us who are interested in regulation, I mean, there was a, a debate starting to happen around this whole veterinary uh, regulation in the U.S. And just by the, the fact that, 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 that this is a debate uh, that not all civil society is even in agreement to shows the complexity of these issues. And therefore, it's a much bigger need that when you are talking about the lens being trade uh, least trade restrictive, why people need to know what is being negotiated. And therefore, strongly encourage you to find out more about this, to ask questions to your policymakers, to your elected officials about what is really happening and to voice your concerns about this. Um, I thank you very much for uh, being part of this webinar today and I apologize that Robert Peterson from ARC 2020 couldn't 
moderate this as he would have liked because of the bad connection, but um, feel free to send in questions even later, and I think um, we'll be happy to answer any questions that were left unanswered. Uh, the webinar in its entirety will be available on IATP's website in a few days, so please check back at www.iatp.org. Thank you very much for joining.